Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zibbyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Kelsey Chittick is the author of Second Half, Surviving Loss and Finding Meaning in the Missing. Kelsey is a writer, comedian, podcast host, and widow of NFL Super Bowl champion Nate Hopgood Chittick. Her memoir, Second Half, shows that life is worth living all in, especially during tragedy. Over the past 14 years, she has performed stand-up comedy all over Los Angeles and speaks at events around the country. She is the co-creator of Keep On, an inspiring and humorous podcast that explores how our greatest obstacles turn out to be our greatest gifts. Although actually she's I don't think she's doing that one anymore because she is launching Moms Don't Have Time to Grieve. So that show is coming out very soon. Growing up in Florida, Kelsey was an accomplished student and athlete, an NCAA championship individual qualifier and captain of the UNC women's swimming team. She was married, as I said, to Super Bowl champion Nate Hopgood Chittick. Follow her here, listen to our amazing episode, and you will see why at the end I was like, you have to host Moms Don't Have Time to Grieve. And stay tuned because that will be coming out soon. And that will be coming out soon on the Zcast Network. Welcome, Kelsey. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This is like my first in-person podcast, and I cannot tell you how long. It's an honor. I I can't believe it worked out. I can't either. It's like meant to be. I wanted to meet you, and I was like, maybe one day I'll go visit my friends in New York, and I'll say, like, we should get coffee after we did the podcast. And then it was just the craziest thing when you said, wait, are you going to be in LA? Yeah. Like life works out. I know. And I literally, I started your book and I was like, I need to read every word of this book. I have to sit down and like, take my time. Like, I need to know your whole story. I'm so glad because first of all, well, first of all, as a book, this is one of the best grief related books. If you want to know what it's like to have the most devastating loss, (laughs) ever and survive. Like, this is the book. This is the book for anybody who thinks they can't move forward and doesn't know how they're going to do it. You did it and you're here and you're talking about it. It's amazing. Thank you. That means a lot. And also some people like don't realize how hard it is to write a book like this that makes it sound like you're just talking to a friend. Mm. It's really hard to pull this off and make it also a cohesive narrative that's like propulsive and everything. So anyway, those are my book things that as a book itself, It's amazing. And now it makes you like fall in love with you as a person. Oh, thank you. So anyway, let me back up. Tell everybody what your book's about. Talk about what happened with Nate, if you don't mind. Sure. So I'll go back to the beginning. I mean, I I had a really good, easy life for a long time. Really, really lucky to have a lot of love and resources growing up. And then I fast forward, swam in high school, ended up getting a scholarship at UNC Chapel Hill and met this big, large, beefy football (laughs) player from Allentown, Pennsylvania that was not at all on my list of who I thought I would marry. But we fell in love my sophomore year, and he ended up playing football in the NFL. He played for about six years on different teams. He won a Super Bowl. And then at some point, we moved out to El Segundo, California, because one of our good friends lived in Manhattan Beach. And we started what I thought was a pretty perfect life. We had two kids. We had a boy and a girl. He was a social worker for a while. He comes from a service family and I worked and we just built this life out here and we loved it. A couple years starting to maybe- By the way, not to interrupt, but the part about the vasectomy, I have to say- Murder him. Oh my gosh. You had the two kids and you're so funny. This might be the funniest thing I've ever heard about, like women's retribution, right? Of like, really? This is what I went through having kids? Like, yes. you're going to complain for two seconds that you're going to have a second me? Like, no, no, no. Right. I was like, this is such a badass woman. I <laughs> love this chapter. Anyway. Oh, thank you. You know, the vasectomy. Yeah, he was a baby. I think all these, I think guys are in general, but I think the bigger you are, the more you can be a baby because people don't question it. So he really went for it, but we had a great life. But around 2015, and I know every mom is overwhelmed and stressed, but I had this like, ugh, mm-hmm. this feeling of like something's off. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I I had anxiety, like I think every woman does. You just don't want anything to happen to your kids and you've got too much going on. And I was going back and forth to the East Coast for work. And I just, 
I wasn't right. And everyone's like, you have everything you want. My kids were like six and eight and we had a really good life, but I just was like, "Mm." something was telling me like, you need to dig into the spiritual side of your life. You need to kind of buckle down and get some tools because you, you aren't well. I would wake up in the middle of the night screaming for him. And I just was like, am I unraveling? Like, am I that Am I that like 38 year old weirdo that's just like going to have to be put away for a bit? And so I kind of went on a spiritual journey for about two years, reading a lot of Buddhist books and just putting together a med- meditation practice. And at some point we went to New York for a 40th birthday party of one of my girlfriends. And I had this like massive panic attack. That was the scariest thing I've ever had. And I remember I had, I had read this book called Code of the Extraordinary Mind and through a thousand different things, I got invited to this trip in Jamaica. And my friend was able to get us to go. And we were going to go on this spiritual retreat and kind of just dig into life and who we wanted to be and what we needed to like release. But I, this panic attack was all around that. Like I didn't want to leave my family. And my husband at the time was like, listen, you have been crazy for a couple of years. Like, I don't know what you're so worried about. Everything is okay. It will always be okay. You have to go to Jamaica. You need to be courageous. You can't just sit here and like try to keep everything together. And so on November 8th, I headed to this spiritual retreat. First time I'd ever left the country and never left my kids and my husband for sure. And I had the most amazing three days of my life. I remember when I landed, it was like something shifted, like my whole world shifted and I was present and all the anxiety had gone away. And I just learned from great speakers and did great, you know, exercises, did Wim Hof and Stephen Cutler and like just, just amazing things. And then the last day, I always cry at this part, but the last day I got a call. We were about to go on this like last venture out on a boat. And one of my friends called and said, hey, listen, don't worry about it. Nate took the kids to Sky Zone, which is a trampoline park. And I was like, who the hell takes their kids to Sky Zone if there's not a birthday party? Like nobody wants to, it's like Chuck E. Cheese, Mm -hmm. right? And they're like, he fell and we don't really know what's wrong, but they've taken him to UCLA. And in that moment, I was like, he's dead. But my friends were like, nothing, there's nothing wrong. He's fine. Just like go on the boat. And I was like, no way. So long story short, I ended up getting on the last plane in the last seat back to the United States, but on the cab ride from the hotel to the airport, um, my mom called and she handed the ER doctor my, you know, her cell phone and he said, I'm so sorry, we tried for 50 minutes to bring your husband back, but he just didn't make it. And he was 42 and he had jumped and he just jumped twice and died in front of my kids. Oh, Kelsey. Which is super dramatic, but I try to laugh about it because it's so ridiculously awful. And I do feel I did stand up for a com- comedy for a long time. So I do feel like Nate left me with like a lot of punchlines just to be kind because it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It's so, it's so awful. It's and this, so awful. The way you wrote about it too, like the way that the day unraveled for you and you and your friends with your wet bathing suits in the cab, like on the plane and and finding out. And, and I, I don't know, it's, and then having to take the flight and even how you talk about how your memory has blocked out so it's much awful. of that day. And people weren't helping you and you were like vomiting and like, it's funny. I, I always, you know, I, I used, I I think of myself as a helpful person, but I I know many times I've walked past people that are like, look upset or something. And now I never do because I don't think we realize that we can help strangers more than we think. We always think like, oh, I won't get involved. But yeah, when I was on the plane and I knew he was gone, it was a long flight back. Oh my gosh. And to California from to Jamaica. That was like, holy shit. And you had to go through Texas or something. Yeah, it's just, I'm like, oh it's, my God. I had a layover. Yeah. Yeah. It was, the, it was the most surreal experience for me of my life, that, that entire plane ride. Because it was weird. I got these nine hours to kind of really go through horrible trauma, horrible shock. And then... And I think that you read the story about the woman on the plane. Yeah, the angel. Yeah. So I had this beautiful woman at some point. Nobody was helping me. And I get it because I think sometimes people just act a fool on a plane or they're drunk or nobody wants to help them. They're just like, Lord, please let this crazy person sitting next to me like calm down or pass out. But this beautiful Jamaican woman stood up when the seatbelt light went off and she put her hand on my shoulder and her hand on my forehead. And she said, you know, baby girl, I don't know what you're going through or what awaits you on the other side of this plane. But so many of us are praying for you and so many people are thinking about you and God is with you. And I need you to slow your breathing down, baby girl. And I need you to figure out what you're gonna do when you when this plane lands. And, um, and then the last thing she said is you're stronger than you think. I mean, if that isn't an angel. Oh my gosh. So the plane ride was this like almost cocoon phase of 
wait a minute, did this just happen? And I was going to tell my kids. So they knew that he had fallen and but they had moved them out of the room pretty quickly. And so they kept FaceTiming me like when I was in Texas, like, mom, dad's okay, right? And and I mean, what are you going to say? So I said, he's, he's not doing great, but we'll figure it out when I get there. I'm so sorry I'm not there. And um, yeah, that was like the worst day ever. Oh my ever. gosh. I'm so sorry. No, I know we were just okay. talking about how I'm so sorry. It's such a pathetic <laughs> thing. Like there's no... I, until we find something better. Yeah. We'll use it. Oh my gosh. So in the book, you not only write about the... You have like, first of all, the play-by-play of everything that happens next and who came in to help. And like, how do you... How did you remember? Did, were you right? You weren't writing it at the time. Yeah, yeah. You were writing it? I like, journaled how, every day. Okay. I journaled every day because I was... I had to get it out. Mm-hmm. And so... But it was sloppy. Just like... I just wake up first thing and I would just be like, I hate my life. I cannot believe this. This is what happened. Thank God this girl arrived today. Thank God this happened. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to go to the morgue. I don't understand what's happening. And so I pretty much wrote every day. Wow. Most of it. I'm most so of the time. I'm glad you did because you're like in it with you, right? There's no way you would remember any of this. No way. And, or you would rev- revise it in yeah. your mind or you'd have it. It would look less. It would either look too shiny or not. I think too... I've spent my whole life trying to be successful and liked and approved of. And this was the first time in my life I didn't give a shit what people thought. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this book is for me to remember what we made it through and for my kids and my grandkids to know the story of us. And so it was, I always say it's like the first authentic thing I've ever done that wasn't underneath the guise of wanting approval. Mm -hmm. Like, so I think what, what happens with this book is it's really just me telling the story without any worry about how it's perceived. Wow. Which was refreshing. You know? I mean, some of the stuff that you talk about too is like, I feel like it's stuff that might, people might want to edit out, right? Or like, yeah, yeah it's particularly, but so important for other people to hear because people think it anyway. Like when you were all at, in your, the nights where you were all like howling and not sure you'd get through the nights and the, oh my God, the way you even wrote about it. But when you got to a point where you're like, you know what, I think I'm just going to like kill myself yeah. and my kids. And you're like, well how much Motrin can they drink? You know, they're not going to want to finish that. You know, like I could just hear it. I, Cause I could like see myself making the same things, right? Like, how are you really? They could, you know, oh, right. I don't really like guns. That's not going to work. You know, <laughs> shoot this, you know, no, it's not, you know, I'm not going to drive off a cliff. Right. So too aggressive. Yeah. Too much. Mm-hmm. But you have, I mean, every mother has those thoughts. Like this isn't going to work. How are we going to do this? And yeah, there was, I, I, I remember when I started to write put the suicide chapter together. One of my good friends, father had just killed himself. And I said, you know, I know I'm going to, she said, are you going to get in trouble for this? Can you get in trouble for this? I'm like, no, no, no. We have trouble because we're not allowed to talk about it Mm -hmm. and actually talking about it. And I, I I don't know that I really wanted to kill myself or my children, right? I I know, I know. But what people, but it's, it's a hopelessness that we all feel. And if we could talk about it, we might be able to feel less embarrassed about how awful it is at the moment without also being like putting, locking people away right away. Right. I was just like, hey, listen, this isn't working for us right. and we need to get to Nate. I mean, that was my feeling like life doesn't work without him. Mm-hmm. I was a baby when I married him. I met him when I was 19. I, I had no idea how to do it without him. I was just lost and I, and the kids were too. And then a couple of weeks later, Jack was like, I, I would like, if I had a gun, I would kill myself. And I was so glad that we had talked about it in a light way. And we use humor a lot in our family to lighten. I think joy and pain are kind of right on the edge of each other. And humor, for me, is one of the best ways to talk about things that are hard. I feel like comedians are the last people that can really say the awful things that we need to discuss in our society. So we do a lot of, you know, I can't believe dad just jumped and died. It's a nice way to be able to bring him up and hold it lightly and then laugh, and then cry. And you also have sort of the trajectory of his entire career, both yeah. as you went through it with him from the early years, through the end, through the aftermath of being in the NFL, yeah. through the physical manifestations, and even like his mother not wanting to play, not being able to watch. And you have all the sort of investigative stuff. I don't want to like give stuff away. I don't yeah. know what you like to talk about or not yeah. from the ending of the book, but you know, how exactly football damaged him and in even things that people don't realize, like the fact that your heart might get stronger and bigger and like can't pump effectively and like what you should be on the lookout. Like it would have been so easy. I was literally saying this to Kyle. I was like, 
maybe you should get this thing, this echocardiogram. 100%. Right? Like they give you EKGs on a physical, but they don't give you the echocardiogram. I'm like, maybe you should just get that every year. What if, what if your ventricle, like how hard is that? Why don't, why doesn't every athlete, I don't know. So there's all this stuff that makes you want to make systemic changes in, in sports to protect all these yeah. men, particularly men. But yeah. I think too, like guys don't realize, and a lot of guys just carry weight and they're bigger and they're like, Oh, it's okay. Well, it's, the, the problem is the bigger you are, the harder your heart has to work. And so what we just have to do is continue to talk about the different medical tests that we can do. I think what happens is in our society, we have a lot of like parameters. So nobody tested, no one did an echo because he was 42. Mm-hmm. You don't do an echo till you're 45. So there's all these rules. But yeah, I think with football players, and I was just talking to your husband about this, I am torn because, I mean, the Super Bowl was so fun just now. And obviously Nate won with the Rams in 99 and it was like a very emotional, cool day. But there's a really big price that people are paying for the joy of this sport. And maybe that's just how life is. Maybe there are trade-offs. I would never let my kid play, ever. I'm not going to say that I don't think there should be football because I do see so much joy and I've met so many amazing people and it's been my whole life. But I would, my, what I will stand behind firmly is kids do not need to be in helmets. They just don't, they can play flag football all the way through until at least they're 16, 17. But we have this culture of people putting little people who don't even know how to like do math and we're banging their brains and they're doing pop Warner and they're out there, you know, anything that has head to head collisions. I just don't know that we need to do that. I think moms should kind of stand up and go, Hey guys, we'll, you can play in college if you sign off and the sign off would be like, let us let you meet some people that have CT. Let us let you meet some people that have, are really sick after playing football and that you don't see them. You don't see, you only see like the guys that are on TV and the guys that have a lot of money, but there's a lot of people that played four or five, six years that aren't well. And I know, because I know I, I talk to them all the time. So I don't have an answer. I'm some of the best men I know played football and some of the men that are hurting most played football. I don't have an answer, but I do say like, try to keep your kids out of helmets. I feel like my son actually plays three sports, all of which require helmets. But they're not, but it's not head to head. It's lacrosse. He's playing lacrosse hockey. and hockey and, and football. Mm. I know. Sorry. I know. I know. I know. I debate I know. it too. Cause he, I know. I feel like I'm, a, I'm like, people look at me like, what? You're letting your son play football. And I'm like, well, I love it. I know, but he, I don't know. I feel like he's in a, his position's okay. Or I don't know. I, I make all these excuses. Here's the thing too. There are a lot of, he's men also that not play. going to college. Do you know, yeah, he's right. not, he's not going to the NFL like hundred percent. And I think you, you've got to like everything in life has cost and benefits. Nate played a long time and he played a position that is what's your son. I'm about to say it. Defensive tackle. No, no. Yeah. That you don't, what you, what I, and again, I'm nothing, everybody. I don't know. I'm just saying personally, I would don't want people on the line that are doing this all day. Yeah. And and now I think too, Nate played 20 years ago and they would do the drills where you drop down, bang each other like, and then drop, you know, like gladiators. None of that is allowed anymore. So they have changed things. It's very, people are very aware. The concussion legacy foundation is trying to get even football players, like John Elway, they're saying like, look at me, mm-hmm. I'm not well. Yeah. Keep these kids out of helmets as long as they can. How old your son? He's 14 and a half. Okay. So almost 15. He's, he's not eight. 15. No, no, he just, and no, he's not eight. Yeah. I mean, I think 14, like ninth grade. He'll play a couple of years. Yes. Yeah. Well, so don't worry. Listen, I'm torn too. And my son was just, my son just said no, but I think partly my son didn't even well, want to. Well, you have to. a lot of. Yeah. It's loaded for us. Yeah. It's loaded for us. Oh my gosh. So back to some of the other stuff in the book too, yeah. is like the power of your friends and your family, mm-hmm. your girlfriends your friend, Michelle, like all these people who showed up for you, not just in the beginning, but over and over and over again, your aunt, your like, like your support system and how you were just like, yes, I need it. Yes. I'm taking this help. I'm in it. Tell me about that. And like how you feel about it now, like even from the people in your community and your neighborhood who were like, yeah, just, you feel safe sleeping here. Come on over. Yeah. Your people. I mean, a lot of that, it was my husband. He was the kindest most present human being I've ever met. Like he was different. Um, and sometimes I think those people go early. He was, Mm -hmm. he was just not, he was not a typical football player. He was not a typical man, father or husband. He was, and he had a whole dark side too. When he was in college, he was a crazy and a partier, but once he had kids, he really had this desire to just listen to people. Like whoever was in front of him was the most important thing in the world. 
And so when you were around him, you felt so seen and so loved and so valued. And he just was an encourager of everyone from the garbage man to the dry cleaner to the mayor. He had time for everybody. And it was, it was so cool. I was so proud to be his wife because I'm not like that. I'm selfish. I'm self-consumed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I like to relax. I don't, I get annoyed with people and he just is love. And so when he died, the outpouring of support for us was enormous. So a lot of that was just the goodness of his heart. And then I luckily, and we just talked about this. I grew up on the East coast where friendships are long and deep. Mm -hmm. I live in LA now. It's, it's such a different vibe. I love it out here so much, but there is something about growing up and actually in my town, we have that because it's like a little enclave that feels a little bit East Coasty. But those girls have been with me since I was like three or four. And we grew up together. We know everybody's dirty secrets. We know everyone's family drama. And they just showed up. They showed up. My neighborhood, all the women that I raised my babies with showed up. And I think everyone was in shock too, because Nate was like the strong Super Bowl champion. Mm-hmm. So they started being like, whoa. I mean, it was, it was it reverberated because he was the one telling everyone to stay healthy. He Mm -hmm. was the one that's telling everyone like, be a better person. And so we felt like we kind of lost like the, the keeper of joy, but, and still to this day, people have showed up for me and continue to do so. And now I'm just trying to return the favor for other people. I'm just trying to be more like Nate, which is hard. (laughs) The way you talked about having to parent through grief too. Yeah. You're like, I didn't get to just like pick up and go to a retreat for like two months. Love. You'd probably, yeah. What did you say? You, you, I want to go have sex with a stranger. Yeah. yeah. You're like, that would be nice. nice. When do I get to have sex with a stranger? You're like, this? it's not, you probably love, it's like cook, go cook, to school. Cry, carpool. Yeah, yeah. Cook, cry, carpool. Uh-huh. Did you think about naming the book that? <laughs> I, I did, but then I was like, I don't want it to just be that, but I do yeah, love no, that kidding. idea that like, I, here's the good part about grief with the children. You have to keep going. Yeah. The bad part about grief with children is you have to keep going. It is so physical, at least sudden death for me was so physically, I don't even know the word. I was so tired mm-hmm. physically. The kids were little still, nine and 12. I mean, they, they felt little still. And so I just, I don't know. I always think that there's some grief books that are, they're hard to read because it's, it's either for me, it was either like, you can be in your grief forever. And I'm like, who has time for that? Like, I want to have a happy life. I want my kids to have a joyful life. I don't want this to define us. And every person that I talk to that lost a parent, like in the fifties or like a generation before us, every one of them was like, I just wish the parent that had stayed alive Mm -hmm. had been joyful. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't just lose my dad. I lost my mom too. I didn't just lose my dad, but you know, my mom, but my dad couldn't function. Mm -hmm. So I was very early on committed to being like, Oh no, no, no. We are going to have a joyful life. I have no clue how, and I'm going to be happy. And we're all going to thrive. And we're going to, Nate's going to come back in our life in some way. I haven't found him yet but we are going to do this for him. He worked too hard. He was too good. He's too amazing for us to just fall apart. And so I I really, I worked on that. And then I did like every type of therapy possible. And that's only because you have resources. And I think everybody deserves resources when they're going through grief because it makes a difference. Because if you try to muscle through grief, forget about it. Mm -hmm. You won't make it. You have to be strategic about your healing. So you have to have practices. So it's not just like a wish and a prayer. Like you have to be like, this is what I'm going to do every day to get better. And I think for me, meditation and writing was it. And it's not a choice. You don't get to be like, I don't know if I want to meditate today. It's like, sit down. And so for a while, I would just sit almost maybe an hour a day. And again, that's a luxury, but I would do 20 minutes or in the car, um, just watching your brain tell stories about how you're, you got screwed or this isn't fair or Why did it happen? And you have to be like, nope, nope. Mm -hmm. Like come back to this moment right now. We're okay. The kids are okay. We're at school. We're alive. Do I feel sad? Yes. Is life sad completely? No. Don't tell a story. So I, I spend a lot more time in quiet now, a lot more time just being. So instead of when I get anxious, like cleaning everything, like I like to do and just like wiping down counters, I just try to sit down and be like, calm yourself. And I don't really have much anxiety anymore. It's amazing but I do a lot less. I don't read 15 books a week. Oh, I'm stop. Stop. I mean, I'm going to start. That's, like, that's a lot though. No, I don't read 15 books every no, day. I know. <laughs> How do you feel with it being a book? Like that's a, it's a, do you feel terrified at all? Do you feel like, no, no, I feel so relieved that the story's there and that I told it truthfully and that you know, I, I, I self-published, so I didn't have anybody's input, which I was really concerned about. Cause at first when I 
shift it out a little bit. And they were like, well, let's do it like this. And I was like, oh, wait, this is a really personal story. So it was really nice to just know that like, this is the truth. And my kids, my kids don't haven't read it. They don't want to read it, but I, so I wish I had published it. Oh, um, it's, it's already out now though. Right. Yeah. What's la- yeah. Launchpad. Oh, you're with them. Um, no, Launchpad is yeah. Anna David. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 She was just on my podcast. Oh really? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. She, she, yeah. That's why I'm in I had an amazing editor and an amazing project manager. And it was just the two of us. And we just wrote and I mean, I wrote it in Google docs and we went back and forth and, but it was very organic and, I was just, we just put the chapters together and they helped me do things like put it chronologically. Like, mm-hmm. how do you, cause I didn't know how to, I've always done stand up, I've always written stuff, but I didn't know how to write a book and how to chronologically go back and forth in between present and like mm-hmm. our relationship. Mm-hmm. And so I had an amazing editor who helped me just like, she'd be like, nope, that doesn't work. And nobody wants to hear that. But that was long winded, but it was, it was a wonderful experience, actually. And, I know my kids are going to hate parts of it. And I just told them that you can write your own book because we all had our own experiences. And I know some of these things, my daughters would be like, I did not do that. And they have their truth too. But for me, that's, that's how it felt those first three years. What are you most like wishing will happen with this book? Like, do you want to hear from people who have gone through it and said like, now this is easier for me or people like what, what are some of your wish list things that like, or, or maybe just the fact that you got it out is, Oh God, you no, know. I, I know I have big dreams. I have, because I remember wanting a book that I could like laugh and cry about. I just wanted it not to be so heavy, but I wanted it to be real. And so many of the books either had some type of like religious mm-hmm. bend or some like sad bend or like, I don't know. I just wanted to know. I wanted, I wanted to I think death, I think it's ridiculous. I think that when you're having someone here and they're just gone, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think most of the widows or people that I talk to are like, yeah, it's mind blowing. It's even more crazy than it is sad at sometimes. Like Mm -hmm. you're like, did that just happen? Mm -hmm. Like, how did this all happen? And then how are people still outstanding? And how are people, who, who are the people that are fighting for joy? And you can see like terrible things have happened. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. We have a society where we kind of we encourage like a lot of emotion and I used to be that way, but now there's also like, it's okay to be like, Nope, like I'm going to, like, I feel this and I'm going to make a spot and then I'm going to, I'm going to keep going because we all only have this one life. And I, I, I grieve all the time. I cry all the time, but I weave it in and out of my regular life because I have a good life and I don't want this to be my only story. So I, I hope the book I would love to talk about it. I love to talk to people about it. I like to talk to, and everyone's lost someone. And I think especially the last two years with COVID, grief is a topic at hand. And we are realizing we don't really know how to do that in this Mm -hmm. country. And our generation didn't really lose that many people. Mm -hmm. The other generations had wars and people got sick. And now we've had this like 50 years of a lot of us not having personal grief or sudden death. Um, Whereas I think our grandparents probably had horrible experiences. So I would love to talk about it. I'd love to write a book like, called Overtime or something about like being 40 and then starting having sex with strangers. No, just kidding. Not <laughs> sex with fish. Um, no, but like, what does it look like when your life completely changes at 40? When you, what you planned is totally different. And what are the gifts that come from that you never expected? And what are the hard parts? I would love to just talk about that because I think a lot of people get divorced, which feels like hugely like loss, very similar. A lot of people just don't, what, their life doesn't look the way they thought it would when they get to that point or motherhood ends and you're like, what am I doing with my life? So I just kind of want to talk about that and um, just have it, keep con- having honest conversations, but with joy and humor and grief all mixed in. What advice would you give to somebody who's trying to write a book? Oh God, I was just right. I mean, I hate when people say that because now, you know, I think we just don't try to do it for anybody else. Mm -hmm. I know that's really hard. If you're an author and that's your business, I guess you have to try to write a good book. But I feel like trying to write a good book is the the problem, right? Just write the book. And uh, I also think what I learned is the the editing process is the most beautiful thing. So just get it down. And if I'm going to tell a terrible secret, but a lot of this, I would, I walked a lot after he died, but I would dictate it into my phone. And then copy it into Google Docs. And then I would have the story down without having to type it. And then I could go back and start to really take out the words. But I I didn't have to sit at the 
computer and just come up with something. I could just like have, I, I do better when I'm moving. And part of being a, a writer is hard because you're stationary. Mm-hmm. So how do we kind of get our bodies moving? And so with iPhones now, it's really easy to dictate in whole ideas and comics do this all the time, but write your chapter on a walk. Mm-hmm. And then you'll look at it and be like 80% of that is garbage, but that right there, I'm going to build on that. And then you have your work for the week, you know? I love that. That's yeah. great. Amazing. Any books that you feel like helped you through so much that you would? Um, yeah. Happen? I mean, Untethered Soul, When Things Fall Apart, Home with God. I mean, I went on a spiritual religious journey. I wanted to know what every Mm -hmm. different, you know, I just think there's so many different things you can pull from and create whatever, you know, works best for you. I'm trying to think what else. There's a spiritual solution to every problem. Uh, Yeah, those are, those are probably, and I still go back to those. So people who now hopefully have all fallen in love with you also (laughs) hearing the story and want to support you and help or do whatever. And where can they find you? What would be most useful to you? Yep. My website is www, this uh, second half book, not the www, second half book.com. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Barnes and Noble. You can buy it at pages in Manhattan beach. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for doing this in person. So So great. So great. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 